Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Good. Awesome. So it was being so helpful to me, and then she messed up my page. And so I have my Bible on this, too, and I brought it back up because I don't know if I always trust technology, so I'm kind of nervous using this thing. Anyways, how's everybody this morning? Great. All right, so... Just like normal, we're going to do a prayer just so that I can stop shaking because I just feel like my knees just might go out on me at any moment. So, um, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that you have put something on my heart to share with my friends. God, I pray that my words come out the way that you laid them on my heart. I just go ahead and give my whole voice to you, God. You know that you already have my heart. And so I just pray that everything that comes out today is what you have for the person here today, God. We love you, we honor you, and we praise your name. Amen. I pray just like I'm kind of nervous, if there's anybody here that today might be your first day to be sitting in a chair, this is your first time to be here checking it out, I pray that you are able to let your nerves calm just a little bit like mine do so that you can hear what it is that God wants to say to you. Um, so, getting started, um, today we're going to talk about the story about the prodigal son. Everybody kind of knows that story a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk about um, an element that I don't know that we talk about all the time, and it's the pig pen part. So, um, do you know what a pig pen is? Stinks. Stinks, yeah. So the pig pen at my house is my daughter's room. And um, she's real young, so she doesn't listen to this quite yet, but when she gets older, she might get mad at me. But um, the pig pen is at my, in my daughter's room right now, and it's a fight because it's in my house. And so then I get real angry when I say, hey, can you go and clean your room for me? It's kind of getting a little bit messy. They know the routine every Saturday morning when they get up after they're kind of lazy. You have to go. You have to clean your room. That way we're ready for the week because my life is kind of a pig pen of some sorts. And so I need at least rooms in our house to kind of flow. Anyway, so I asked her, can you go and clean up your room? My four-year-old, he has no problem letting me know, Mom, I did it. I crammed everything under my bed and in my closet, mom, is so clean. And so you walk in his room and you're like, whoa, my four-year-old just like totally cleaned this room. And it's okay, I don't go and look under the bed or in the closet because he already told me that's where everything's at. But to my knowledge, right there in front of me, it's clean. Now my daughter, on the other hand, she doesn't like to admit that she likes living in a pig pen, but that's exactly what she likes. And I don't know if it's just the age or what's going on, but literally to walk in her door, to open the door, things start just shoveling behind the door. And you're like, what was that? And then to walk through a little bit, you like you step over something, you move something. Literally at night, in order for Gracie to go to bed, I have to tell her, I need you to clear off your bed so that you can get ready for bed. And that drives me insane. But needless to say, that's the pig pen at my house. Um, like I said, my life sometimes feels like a pig pen, but that is just because I'm so unorganized. And I have these really great friends who keep encouraging me to just learn to embrace it. Just go with it. And I'm really not sure how to do that. And so this week I had a moment where I actually thought I went crazy. Like, really crazy. Um, I went to the bank last week and I cashed a check. And I don't keep a check register. I don't write things down. I don't know what, you know, all that's supposed to look like or whatever. I check the internet to see what my balance says. And, you know, I hope that all that gets paid and whatever. And sometimes my water gets cut off. I'm learning, you know, that I just pay the city extra money every year just because I don't know how to be on time. So see, my life is kind of a pig pen. So last week, I went to um, the bank, cash this check, and I didn't pay attention. You know, like, you don't, do you really pull forward and count your money and make sure they gave you the right amount? No, I don't have time for that because I'm late to the next thing already. So anyways, um, at the bank, I put my money away, and I'm like, oh, I've got stuff to pay later with that. So I know where it's going. I don't get to keep it. And so... It's later that I go to pay for something that I realize I was given a little bit too much money. And so, of course, your first thought is, oh, my gosh, this is so exciting. But not mine, because I really started panicking, because then I started thinking, oh, my gosh, did I grab money from somewhere else and bring to the car, and I was going to give that bill all that money? 
and I'm freaking out, right? So immediately I call the bank and I'm like, hey bank, what's up? Um, I think somebody gave me too much money. And so a couple days later they call back, they're like, nope, looks great. There, nobody was off, nobody was short, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, how did that money get here? So now I'm really kind of freaking out. So now I'm asking my nine-year-old who, regardless of the fact that she lives in a pig pen, she keeps a calendar of all of the events. And so now I'm checking with my nine-year-old and I'm like, hey, um, Gracie, what did I do the other day? Did I go somewhere? What did I do? Like, and she's thinking, she's telling me list by list all of these things that I did. And I'm like, so no, but nowhere like I would have just got some money. And she's like, no, you spent some money though. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm really kind of freaking out. So I call the bank back and I'm like, hey, you know, are you sure everything's fine? So this is when my pig pen of a life kind of got in the way because this lady told me that I never even went to the bank. Yep. So then I stop the car as I'm driving because, you know, we're on the way to the next thing. So I stop the car, I pull over and I'm like, all right, Gracie, we got to talk. What did I do for real on Friday? And so Gracie is telling me all these things and the bank has no record of me ever going to the bank. And so I'm like thinking I've lost it. Like my unorganization has gone to a whole new level at this point. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I either went to the bank or I didn't go to the bank. And what did I do? And I can't even remember. And it's only Monday. I can't remember Friday. So finally, I realized I did. I cashed a friend's check. And so um, that was a lot of fun. And um, found out that money really wasn't mine. And I didn't get to go on a shopping spree. Or I really had to pay my bills this week. But the whole point is that my life was so crazy. I really started thinking the bank lady might have been right because I couldn't remember if I really went to the bank or not. The only way, my car looks like a pig pen, like my daughter's room, so if you get the idea, she gets it from somewhere. But we're not talking about that today. Um, so I finally find this paycheck stub. It's not mine. And that's why the bank didn't have any record of me being there. And so that's why my life is a pig pen and it's crazy and it's a mess and I'm really working on it. This is the one area that I would like to get a little more organized. Do you have an area like that? An area of your life that you're like, oh my gosh, this is so insane. Maybe I really am crazy or maybe I need to do something about it. And so I have this really cool calendar and stuff that I'm going to try and start using next week. And, you know, we'll see how that goes. I even have these envelopes for money. We're going to try that one week too. But anyways, we start small, right? Baby steps, right? We're going to use the calendar first. So anyways, that's my life of a pig pen. And that is an area of my life that I really do need to work on. Um, but it all comes down to a choice. I have to make this decision that I want to do better, that I want to be organized, that I want to be able to be like, oh no, I know what time I went through the bank and it was this time on this day, not checking with my nine-year-old to say, I really have no idea what I did last Friday. Anyway, so back to the story of the prodigal son, since now y'all can see my crazy. Are y'all good now? Y'all like that? Okay. So um, the story about the prodigal son that a lot of people talk about is the celebration when the son comes back. And it's great. And for all of you guys who are sitting there thinking, I don't know what story you're talking about, I understand. I struggle with that too. And so um, if you look in Luke 15, if you want to flip over there, I'm just going to kind of read through this story for you um, just to tell you a little bit about it so you can follow along with me. Um, there was this man, and he had two sons. There was a younger son, and he told the father, he went to him, and he said, I want my share of the inheritance before you die. Well, that sounds a little crazy, but he said, before you die, I want my portion of the inheritance. So I know the things that I would think of at first when my kid came and said that to me, but this father, he just said, all right, and he gives him his portion. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy must really love his son because I would have been thinking a few other things to my kids, but he gives his son his inheritance. A few days later, this son packs up all of his belongings. He packs up all of his things, and he leaves. He goes to another country. 
Surely he has a plan, right, while he's leaving. Like, he knows where he's going, knows what he's fixing to do. That's kind of what you would think. Um, And he does. He goes to this distant land, and he wastes all of his money, and the Bible says, on wild living. So he goes and he's partying, and at this point, I believe he's probably surrounded by people who think, man, this guy's got the money. If you want to party, this is where we're going, right? Like all stories, there's a bad ending because suddenly he runs out of money. And he runs out of money at a terrible time because a great famine comes across the land. And now this young son is at a desperate place. He didn't have a plan. He didn't know where he was going, and he didn't know what he was doing. And now he has no money. And now I'm sure all those friends that were surrounding him at this time when he did have money, and he was the life of the party, they're probably not there anymore. So he persuades a local farmer to give him a job. And this local farmer is fine with giving him a job, But he's going to give him the job that he doesn't want to do so much, which is taking care of the pig pen. And so while this young guy is in this pig pen taking care of these pigs, he starts to notice that the pods that the pigs get to eat are starting to look good. And so he comes to this place where he recognizes in his desperation, where he's at in a pig pen, working for somebody else. And so he has a choice that he gets to make. He has a decision to make at this point. He can continue staying here in this pig pen, or he can make a decision. And so he finally, the Bible says in verse 17, he finally came to his senses. And he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here, I'm dying of hunger. He said, I will go home. I'll ask my father if I can come back. I will tell my father I have sinned, but will you please take me back? I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please just take me in as your hired servant. And so he returns home. And the father, instead of taking him in as his hired servant, the Bible says that the father was so excited, he ran out to meet him. He could not wait for him to get there. And he runs out, and instead of being angry, He says, we are fixing a party because my son is home. And so that is the part that we always get so excited about because we know that the father received him with open arms. He never left him. He never stopped praying for him. He never stopped wanting his son to return home to him. So we get so excited about that part. But I really want to talk to you guys about what has happened to the young guy at the pig pen. What happened to the guy that led him to this place? See, his father, when he went to him and he demanded his inheritance, he went to him and he said, give me. Give me my portion before you die. You know, when you think back to Jewish tradition, that was a huge insult to this father that the son didn't even want to stay here to help, to earn his inheritance. He just expected him to just give it to him. So I start thinking in my own life, because any time I read something here, sometimes it's not what I want to hear, but I know that there's going to be something that's going to touch home that I have to start looking at myself. And so in this story, I start to think, How does that reflect in my own life? And it came real fast. And how many times do I pray, God, give me right now. God, do this right now. And a lot of times I put some conditions on it 
God, if you will give me, then I will whatever. So am I insulting God whenever I say, give me, and he decides, now you are not ready, and he withholds something from me? What is my attitude at that point? What is my behavior? What is my choice in that moment? Because I have one. I have a choice. I get to do something. I get to decide something. If God answers my prayer in the way that I expect him, that I've demanded him, that I want him to do, well, then I love him. And I'm like, thank you, Father. That is so awesome. But when he doesn't do it the way that I ask him to, in the moment that I ask him to, well, then I suddenly start pouting and I'm mad. God's not listening to me. I don't even know why I'm praying right now. He doesn't ever answer my prayers the way that I ask him to. This father in this story, he didn't even say anything. He didn't try to tell his son, have you thought this through? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know where you're going to take your inheritance? What are you going to do with it? Do you have a plan? He didn't try and talk through anything. It just says that he just gave it to him. And so I really started thinking about God and the way that I talk with God and the way that I ask him for things and the choices that I make based on whether I hear from him or whether I don't. Sometimes, I saw this quote the other day that I thought was just so awesome, and it said that sometimes the teacher is most silent during the test. So there have been times that I've begged God for an answer, begged him to tell me something, and I got no response. And so I made a choice by myself at that point. I decided myself to do whatever it was that I was asking for God that he didn't want to do at the time. So maybe it's an insult to God that I think that I can do it better or faster or at the right time. Maybe he's listening to somebody else's prayer that he couldn't hear that I'd already asked for that. Maybe he's busy. So if I decide myself to just do something, then I was helping him out, right? The thing is, when we decide something for ourselves, we make a choice based on ourself, based on our own emotion. That is going to lead us to sin because it's all about me. It's give me, give my, I want now. So it's all about myself. And that leads me to a sin because I have at this point stepped outside of doing what God has asked me to do. What is sin anyways? I know we get all tied up in it and we start thinking all these things about sin and we get real particular about wording and that kind of stuff. But isn't sin doing, substituting something in the place of God? Isn't sin life outside of God's will? Isn't sin doing what I want to do, making myself God? Isn't sin choosing to do what I want to do? Isn't sin death? I mean, sin can look like a lot of different things. It will manifest in a lot of different ways. And I know that as people, as flesh, we like to say, well, my sin's not as bad as that sin, so I'm kind of okay. But sin is sin, and it's anything that comes in between you and the will of God. It comes between you and the life that he has already laid out for you to live. Sin leads to the pig pen, which is where this young boy found himself. He made a decision on himself, it led him to sin, and then he ended up in a pig pen. And so when you think about it, and you think on your own terms, on your own stories, what kind of choices have I made for myself that have put me in a place, that have put me on a road to sin, that I'm going to end up in the pig pen? So then, you know, this guy, the dad, he just gives him his money, he goes and he lives a wild life, is what it said. And so I really started thinking, we've had some great messages lately about surrounding yourself with the right kind of they, what kind of people are surrounding you with, and that's why I want you to think about, he wasted all of his money. And I'm sure that during this time, there was no shortage of people telling him how to spend his money, what to do, what kind of alcohol to buy, what kind of party to throw, anything like that. I'm sure there wasn't a problem 
having friends. How is it that sometimes when you choose to do something that is leading you down a path for sin, you find yourself surrounded? There's lots of people there willing to give input, willing to help you out, willing to listen to you complain. But once it says that he wasted all of his money, he had nothing. And I'm sure those friends, that they, that he had surrounded himself with, made a decision that they needed to move on. They need to find somebody else who's going to be a little bit more cheerful. Sorry about your luck, buddy, that you spent all your money. That was your choice. Now I make a choice to move on. And so it's suddenly that he finds himself in a desperate place. He has no one. He chose himself over his family. He went down the path that led to sin, and now he is in this pig pen, and he is alone. He is so alone, he is so desperate, that he's looking at the food the pigs get to eat, and he's actually thinking, that looks good. And so you really think um, also in Jewish history, like in the tradition, for this guy to be in a pig pen, it's like the lowest of lows. Because the pigs were considered unclean. That at this point, he is living not just like below his means, like, oh, I don't have a couple of bucks to go to McDonald's for a dollar cheeseburger. Like, he's living below that. Like, maybe I should dumpster dive in the back to see if there's any half-eaten dollar cheeseburgers. So he's in this pig pen, and he has a decision to make. So remember, the choices that he made for himself have led him to sin and they have put him in this pig pen. But that's where the story has hope. Because at this point, he doesn't have to stay in the pig pen. He has a choice that he gets to make. And so while he is in the pig pen, it says that he came to his senses. He's going to go back to his father and he's going to tell his father, I messed up. I chose myself over everything else. Will you please take me back? Will you please at least hire me as your servant? Because I know they get paid to eat and they eat well. Will you please at least just take me back doing that? I'll do anything. He's already got this all played out in his brain, what he's going to do as he goes back to talk to his father. So in the pig pen, he has made a decision. In the pig pen, after all of his sin, he has made a choice. He has decided, I'm going back to my father. You see, I'm thinking through as a guy, a young guy who went and demanded, give me so that I can live my life the way I want to live and he did for a time period, I have to imagine the kind of pride that he's got built up as he's working in the pig pen. I have to imagine what his thoughts are. And immediately, as I was reading through this story, the word humble came up because this man, at this point, has to humble himself to go back to his father. And I can only imagine that that is a hard thing to do. But he's ready, and he's going to make that choice to step out and go back home. And so as we read a little bit further, it says that he did decide to go home, and his dad was so excited, and so his dad celebrated. You see, he left his father on a demand His dad willingly gave him his share, and he knew what his son was doing was wrong. And he knew that his son was taking that money to live the life for himself. He knew the kind of lifestyle that his son was going to go and step into, but he still didn't withhold it. He still let him make his own choices, 
the son leaves. And when he comes back, the father never once in this scripture, never once said, well, wait a minute. I don't know. We're going to have to talk about what you've done while you've been out and about. I don't know what you did. I don't know what you did with the money. Do you have receipts? Did you keep a check register of all these things that you did? Do you have a scorecard of all of the bad things that you did? He didn't do that. He welcomed him with open arms, ready for a party, ready to celebrate. And so then I start to think, how does this look like real life? How does that look like my life? See, we all make choices. Sometimes we do make decisions based on ourself. Sometimes we can catch those decisions before they put us in a pig pen. But most of the time when we choose those choices based on ourself, it's real quick that we find ourselves on that path to sin. And maybe we want to deny that path that we're on. But if we want to deny it, the pig pen is inevitable. We'll get there at some point. And maybe in the process there will be another sin, another thing. Something else happened. Got to cover that last one up. Oh gosh, I'm still trying to fix that first one. You know, it's like I describe with my nine-year-old. We've been talking a lot about um, lying and friends not being nice. She's in intermediate school, and my goodness, kids are mean. I really wish she was a little bit more aggressive, but she's not. And so the only thing that I know how to teach my nine-year-old is how God sees these things. And so, you know, we talked about lying and being mean, and I told her, I was like, Gracie, imagine that God is here right beside you. I said, and say that you start to make one choice, and it is only one choice. And that one choice is bad. And so it takes you just one step away from God. And it's just one, one time. Don't worry, Mom. It was just one time that I lied. Well, now we got to cover up that lie. And so that one's going to make me one, just one more, one more step away from him. It's just one. It's not that big a deal, Mom. And then she decided she was going to be mean to her brother. And so, you know, God doesn't like that either. And so that's just one more thing. And for Gracie, that's what it was. It's just one thing. And as we go through life, we just keep taking this one step and this one more step. And before I know it, I, God is way back here. That one step, that one choice, that one decision to put myself first, to make sure that I was okay, make sure that I was happy, make sure that I have what I need to have, has put a space between me and God that I never intended. It was just one time. It was one choice. And so as Gracie saw the distance, for us it was the distance that it put between myself and Gracie, she broke down in tears. And she said, Mama, I don't want that space between you. Mama, I don't ever want to be apart from you. I don't ever want one choice to ever put a space in between me that I can't get back to you. And that is where it was great because I said, Oh, baby, I promise. There will never be enough steps that you ever take that will ever, ever keep me from being able to just walk over there and snatch you up in a hug and tell you, I don't care what you have done. I love you more than any of the words in this world could ever describe. And that is the love of the Father. That is the love of the Father in this story, and that is the love of your Heavenly Father. There are not enough steps that you have taken. There are not enough self-choices that led you to sin that put you in a pig pen that could not ever come back to the Father with His open arms. You see, the whole time, the Son, He was right with His Father. The whole time that you have been living your life the way that you wanted to live your life, you have been right with God. You know why? Because he sent his son here to die for you on a cross. You were made right on that day. On that day, he said, I don't care what it is that you do in your whole lifetime. I love you more than the words that I can say. I can't describe them, so I've only got to do an action. And he died a painful, brutal death for you and for me. 
And so when we make these decisions, when we choose ourself that leads to sin and put us in a pig pen, that doesn't mean you have to stay there. The story is not over. You're not stuck. There's no lock on that gate. You can jump over that pig pen. You see, something else in this story that I thought was just crazy was that the father gave him his money. He let him go and do what he knew he was going to do. He let him go to make the choices that he knew he was going to make. He knew that he was not going to be living a right life, but he let him go anyways. And what I found odd, that father never went in search of his son. The father stayed at home doing what he was meant to do, taking care of his land and his household. He didn't go jumping from pig pen to pig pen. He didn't go from town to town. He didn't go searching for his son. Did the father have faith already in his father that he knew his son would come home to him? Did the father have faith in the prayers that he was praying on behalf of his son that he would find his way out of the pig pen? So that day that he made this choice, he had to decide I have to humble myself, and I have to decide that I'm going back. And that I'm going back asking for the lowest position possible. So when I find myself in my own circumstances, it's knowing that I have the decision to make. I have the choice, and it just takes one choice. It just takes one decision. It takes humbling myself to say, God, what is it that you want me to do? And sometimes hearing his answer isn't what you want to hear. Sometimes hearing what it is that he has to say to your heart really isn't what you intended for him to say back to you. When you hear his voice, that's where you have a choice. Are you going to listen? Are you going to hear him? Are you going to move on behalf of what it is he has spoke to you? Every day, guys, we are faced with choices some of them are easy, some of them are instant, and some of them take a little bit longer. But we all have a decision, do we make this for myself, or do we humble ourselves and listen to the Father? You know, I really was trying to think of just my own things that I've gone through to share with you so that you could think through some things, you know. And it's hard. It's hard to share them. And I know you're sitting there thinking about your own pig pen, and that is great. It is okay to think about where you are today because this is the starting place to ask him. I'm in a pig pen. I'm ready to humble myself. I'm tired of being here. I know that with you, when I'm next to you, when I'm in your will, when I'm letting nothing separate you, I know that that is where life is. And I'm tired of the death. I'm tired of the separation. I'm tired of living outside of your will. I have to humble myself so that I can experience life. And you are the only source of life, God. And so I'm ready to humble myself. I'm ready to let you take my whole heart. You know, we go through all of these life things and, you know, bankruptcy, divorce, these things, we make decisions based on ourselves, right? We spend more than we have, but I want it, and so I need it now. And so we buy it anyways, even though I have no way to pay for it. I really don't think that they should be giving college kids um, credit cards if they still do that, because that's when I got in debt, and it was somebody else's fault because they were standing under the tent who gave me a free T-shirt, and so I got this credit card. And so I started buying stuff because it said, buy now, pay later. Who cares that I didn't have a job? Do you see how my pig pen started real early? And so... You buy now. It's somebody else's fault. They shouldn't have had that thing on sale. But it's okay because now I'm going to file bankruptcy. When you file bankruptcy at that point, now you have a choice. Are you going to go back to your pig pen? Are you going to go back and get another credit card? Because it's going to make your credit better if you open another one. No. Are you going to put yourself back in that place? Or are you going to humble yourself and say, you know what, I was living way outside of my means. It's time to take it back a little bit. It's time for me to decide, God, what is it you want me to have and what is it that I'm not supposed to have right now? And just because he doesn't answer you in the moment doesn't mean he's never going to give it to you, right? He wants to love you. He wants to flood you with blessings. 
You know, so many of my friends go through divorce. I was right there on the edge of a divorce because I was operating out of myself. He was not loving me the way that I needed him to love me. He was not doing the things that I needed for him to do around the house. He was not taking care of my daughter the way that I thought he needed to be taking care of my daughter. He was not providing for us in a way that I thought he needed to be providing for us. And so that was all about me. And I said, you know what? You're not doing it the way that I want you to do it. And so I'm done with this. I'm just going to move on to something else. And I'm going to do it a different way this time. Because in my mind, myself knew better than the father who had me in this marriage. And so I decided I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. God, of course, had other plans. He intervened in a big way, but it's because I broke down on my knees one night and I said, I can't do this on my own, God. I give you my heart. Every broken, shattered little piece is yours to take and you tell me what it is that you want me to do. And I promise you, when I heard him say, you stay, you don't go, I cried and I argued and I said, you don't know. But he knows. There is nothing in your life that he doesn't already know. But you have to be willing to humble yourself. You have to be willing to make that one choice to do what he says to do. And in my story, it was to stay. And let me tell you, it was so hard to stay. But I did because I heard him loud and clear when I was praying that day that I was to stay. You know, when we do go forward, I can imagine just because I know my own emotions and I know how they are crazy. Had I gone through with myself and allowed myself to get on this road that was going to lead me to a pig pen, along the way, I was going to be willing to pick up some extra baggage. You see, I was going to become bitter and it was Chris's fault and I was going to become angry and I was going to start taking that out on my children and I was going to start being mad at anybody else who had anything to say about my situation that I was in because they didn't know. They didn't live there. They don't know what I went through. They don't know what my story looked like in our house. But all those motives that I was going to be picking up along the way had I gone through with my own decision were not going to bring life. They were going to continue to keep me locked down in death. So if you're here and you're thinking of your own stories of your own pig pens, you are not alone. You see, even now that I've made the decision that I don't want to live in a pig pen, I don't want it to look like that. I want it to be different. Well, daily, I have a choice that I get to make on an everyday basis. How am I going to choose to live my life? Is it going to be about me? Is it for myself? Or is it going to be to bring glory to God? And every day, I have to make a decision. When I hear him say something, do I honor him by going ahead and doing what it is that he has set in front of me? Or do I go ahead and take care of myself that will lead to sin and eventually put me in a pig pen? You know, there are days that I'm learning what it looks like to live as a single mother, and it is not necessarily all roses and bluebell chocolate ice cream, okay? There are some days that those two cute little kids are really challenging my day. Just last week, I had to buy a new toilet, okay? Because my four-year-old wanted to see what happens when you put a square block in the toilet. And I really thought a plumber could get that out, but he said it's been very rare that he's never been able to get something out of a toilet. Well, we're rare, and um, he couldn't get that out. So that day, I had a choice. I couldn't yell at him in front of the plumber, because then the plumber would know I'm crazy. And so I had a choice to make as my four-year-old looks up at me and says, Mama, will you still be my best friend? Yes, I'll still be your best friend, but don't ever stick something in the toilet again. But every day, you guys, there's a choice. Some of them are big choices that you are facing, and some of them are little choices that you are facing. Some of them are, do I let my crazy go and yell at this kid in front of the plumber, since he just cost me a lot of money, or do I just say, yes, I'm your best friend? Some of them are huge decisions that you're facing. Do I go forward with this divorce? Do I wait? 
Do I move out of this house? Do I live in this house? What is my career path? Do I do this or do I do that? Do I go to college or do I stay? Speaking of college, oh my gosh, young people, there is something there for you guys. Besides the fact that I don't think they should be giving credit cards to college kids, the other thing is that there should be like some serious counseling with college kids. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do this story real quick for you guys. College kids, this is for you, or high school kids, this is for you, okay? So, went to college back in the day because that's what everybody said to do. I didn't know what I wanted to be, so everybody was being nurses back then when I was going to school. So I was like, that sounds good. I think they make a lot of money. Um, that's great. And so I start college, and I'm going to be a nurse. Their outfits are real cute, and I wouldn't have to pick something out every day when I go to work because I already have it laid out, right? So I'm going to be a nurse until I get to a and in college. And there was blood, like real people blood in this class. I was like, I thought this was a textbook class. What are we doing? So I quickly decided I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a nurse. So I changed my major, and I start going, I think I started to be, I wanted to be a teacher at this point, because my friend, she was being a teacher, and so she was like, oh, this is real easy. She was like, you only go like four years. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I started to go to school to be a teacher, at this time, I didn't really like kids, and so when I really thought about being in this room with like 20 or 30 kids, that really freaked me out. I was like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to be a teacher. So then at this point, I'm like, gosh, well, what's left to do? Like nursing, teacher, okay, that's all. So I'm not going to go to college anyways. I mean, I'm marrying this boy, right? He's going to take care of me. So the great part of that story is I did marry the boy. Um, anyway, so I leave college. I'm not going back there. Don't need it. Okay, well, fast forward my life like 15 years, and I'm going back to college. But these choices that I made 15 years ago, well, they're still following me. You see, I went into the counselor. I thought, like, bad credit, they let it go after seven years, so you think that's like everything, right? And I even went and started reading in scripture, and there's a lot of stuff about seven years, and so I'm like, oh, I'm good, so I go back to college, right? And so they pull up my transcript, and I'm like, hold the phone, uh, why are we pulling up my transcripts again? I just want to start over. And she said, oh, well, it doesn't work that way. Why? I don't want to be a nurse or a teacher or whatever I chose to be back then. I'm something else now. She's like, well, oh, whoa. Oh, wow, you were not very serious about school, were you? I'm like, uh, no, I really just wanted to get married. So she's like, wow. And I'm like, can we close the door or something? My goodness, why are we talking about my grades like that? Needless to say, my one choice or two or three choices back when I was in college, they've followed me. My GPA, it's like way down here. Like, you know, I'm glad my mom doesn't have expectations for me to graduate with honors or like this big ceremony because that's just not going to happen because my choice 15 years ago has followed me. Whatever you're going to college right now, whatever you guys are preparing to do as you're fixing a venture out into the world, this is for you. The decisions you make today, yes, you will be able to fix those. And yes, I am in college and everything's going fine and I'm making much better grades because I'm not 18 years old trying to convince a boy to marry me anymore. But they're still following me. And now I am in my 30s, I am a grown-up, but I still have to deal with those consequences. Yes, I still get to go to school, it's all gonna move forward, I am gonna be able to provide for my kids in the future, but they're still there. And so whatever you do, kids, as you are venturing out, know that these things are gonna follow you. The choices that we make, the decisions we do, they can be right with God, yet at the same time, there will be consequences that you have to muddle through later. So why not humble yourselves, ask him, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to go to college for? How do I live in your will? I don't want to be in a pig pen. 
I don't want to make my own choices based on myself that will lead me somewhere else. So I want you guys to say this with me. Self leads to sin, and you end up in a pig pen. Okay, y'all are going to have to try that again. Okay, let's liven up real quick. Self leads to sin and puts you in a pig pen. Okay, y'all got that? Choices based on myself will put me on a road to sin that I will end up in a pig pen. And so if you want to change that, then you have to humble your heart. There are two verses that I just want to share with you. In Luke 14, 11, Jesus says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Guys, God has a plan for you. God has something big for you. And God does not want you living in a pig pen. He is just like the Father, waiting there to celebrate with you. If you are finding yourself right now in a pig pen, you are not alone and you are at the right place. If you need something today, if you need prayer, if you don't even know what to do to get out of the pig pen, then find somebody here that will be standing over there on that wall who is ready and willing to pray with you, to help you, to show you, to guide you, to be there and encourage you that you don't have to stay stuck in this pig pen anymore. It's time for us to get back to the Father and it's time for us to celebrate with Him. If you will, just stand up with me. I'm going to pray over us.